This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you for picking Teen Health above the World Series for one night. I really appreciate it personally. Um, my name is Marisa Raymond Flesh. I work both in the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine here at UCSF and also in the Institute for Health Policy Studies. Um, and I thought that it might be useful for you guys to have a little bit of a sense of who I am um, and why I'm interested in this topic as we start. So I grew up in New Mexico. Um, as you guys know, it is a um, fairly rural state. It's a state that borders Mexico. Um, it is a state with incredibly poor health outcomes, particularly for adolescents and young adults. It has the highest rates of teen pregnancy in the country. It has incredibly high rates of um, DUI-related uh, fatalities, substance use, particularly methamphetamine. Um, I went to a high school where I had a 60% dropout rate, where we had um, a a daycare center on campus for all the pregnant and parenting teen moms so that they could stay in school. And every year at graduation, we had a moment of silence for all the students who had died due to gang violence that year. So I grew up in a place that it was really easy to become motivated to do work to improve that situation. Um, and I was very excited during medical school when I found out that adolescent medicine was a subspecialty. I had a plan, I was going to invent it and it was going to be fine, but I was really excited when I found out that you could actually just do this and do research to help these populations. So today we're going to be talking about maximizing care for underserved and marginalized youth. And I'm going to tell you about what I really believe in as a researcher, which is taking a community-based approach. So adolescence is a time of physical and emotional development. It's a time of social growth um, and a time when teens are learning to navigate their newly developed bodies, when they're building a sense of their individual identity. They're really deepening their friendships and their romantic attachments and figuring out where they fit in the world. But for some teens, this process doesn't go well. And for some teens, there are particularly poor health outcomes that we're going to think about together as a group. And the question that we're really going to try and get at as a group is, why are there these poor health outcomes for some teens? And what can we do to change that? So we're going to start our discussion today by identifying um, some particular marginalized youth that we're going to talk about more in depth. We're going to then um, look at the health outcomes for these specific populations. We're going to go from there to thinking about what causes their health disparities. And we're going to then talk about one specific project as an example of how we might address um, these health disparities for marginalized youth. So beginning with the first question, who are marginalized youth? So there are many different ways that we could create labels, that we could identify specific populations that might have poor health outcomes. Um, I'm going to really focus today's discussion on a couple of specific groups that we know a reasonable amount about. I'm going to talk about sexual minority youth. I'm going to talk about rural youth. I'm going to talk about undocumented youth or the children of undocumented parents. Um, I'm going to talk about minority youth, but we could talk about many, many other um, groups of marginalized youth. We could talk about youth with specific physical or mental health problems. We could talk about teen parents. We could talk about street youth, about gangs, about incarcerated youth. There's unfortunately sort of no limit to the different marginalized populations that we can identify. And the important thing to remember is that teens in each of these groups face their own challenges, but all of them collectively have disproportionately poor health outcomes in some way. Um, and they all face some type of barrier to accessing health care. And that's why we're thinking about them as sort of a bigger group today. 
So now that we've kind of identified some marginalized youth that we're going to think about, the next thing that we're going to think about are the health outcomes for these marginalized youth. Um, and I, I will sort of step into this next phase of our discussion with a little bit of caution. I think one thing to know is that even as we try and describe some of these populations, there are populations that it is very challenging to engage in research. So what we know about them is a little bit limited, and we still need more information. There are probably even more ways in which there are health disparities that we don't yet understand. So beginning with sexual minority youth, um, I'd like to think about um, these populations in terms of several different kinds of outcomes when we have data on it. So for these youth, we're going to think about social outcomes, physical health outcomes, and mental health outcomes. So beginning with um, sexual minority youth, thinking about just the social outcomes of their status. So compared to heterosexual peers, sexual minority youth, and I'm talking about sort of anyone who would fall under that LGBTQ umbrella, um, have higher risk for reporting discrimination, for reporting social rejection from their peers, and most importantly, for, uh, for reporting rejection from their families themselves. Um, these have really real repercussions for youth in terms of their physical safety and their educations. So these youth are more likely to be victims of bullying and violence, sort of directly threatening their physical safety. And because of that, they're twice as likely to skip school due to fears for their safety. So that's really directly impacting their education as well. Um, if we think about the physical health outcomes for this group, we know that gay and bisexual young men have higher rates of HIV, syphilis, and several other STDs on a population level. We also know that, interestingly, lesbian and bisexual young women have higher rates of unintended pregnancy, which isn't immediately obvious, and we might have a chance to talk a little more about that later. Um, and then we also know that all sexual minority youth have higher rates of uh, cigarette use, of alcohol use, and of use of other drugs. Um, and that really is interrelated with their mental health outcomes. So compared to heterosexual peers, sexual minority youth have higher rates of depression, of completed suicide, but also suicidal thoughts and gestures, and higher rates of um, what seems like disordered eating behavior, so restricting their nutrition intake in an attempt to control their weight. So we talked about sexual minority youth. We're going to move on to the um, physical health of rural youth. And this is one population in particular that we know very, very little about in terms of actual numbers. So I'll present what I was able to find that seems reliable. Um, we know that um, in terms of physical health, we actually have a lot of information about reproductive health for um, rural youth. And rural youth have higher birth rates than youth in urban or suburban counties. And while we're making headway in terms of um, decreasing rates of teen parenting overall in the United States, it's really not falling at the same rate for rural youth. They're really sort of stagnant in their rates of um, becoming teen parents. Rural youth also have higher rates of drugs, particularly um, not just things like um, alcohol and cigarettes, but also other things that we don't see as much in other communities. So we see a lot of chewing tobacco in our use in our rural youth, and we see a lot of methamphetamine in our rural youth. Um, really rates that are more than twice as high as we see in urban populations. Interestingly, we actually don't see as high of rates of marijuana use in rural youth. So the patterns really are different. Um, and the other misconception about rural youth is that they're sort of isolated and they're probably safe because of that. But actually, our data says that they are just as likely to be victims of violence as urban youth. Um, and in fact, in some studies um, where rural youth are surveyed, they're actually more likely to report carrying a weapon to school than their urban counterparts. So these are kids that really are at, at great risk in many ways. In terms of mental health outcome, our data is limited, but we do know that they have higher rates of completion of suicide, um, in part probably due to using more fatal methods, so particularly gunshots um, as a method of suicide. And then we know that there are huge barriers to accessing mental health care and any confidential physical health care as well. Part of that is due to just distance to provider and unavailability of provider in rural settings. But the other reality is that um, if we're talking about teens, for example, a, if a 14-year-old wanted to access reproductive health care or see a therapist, they, they can't drive. How are they going to do that without involving a parent or an adult? And so their ability to access any confidential services is incredibly limited. 
Now let's transition to minority youth. I'm gonna focus on two particular groups of um, minority youth in the United States. I'm gonna talk about African Americans and I'm gonna talk about Latinos, just a little bit on each. So in terms of health outcomes for African Americans, when compared to other racial groups, they have the highest rates of death by homicide. They have the highest rates of HIV infection and also um, in terms of reproductive health, they have the second highest rates of teen births. They, have, they are more likely um, than one would expect to be uninsured. And importantly, all of this really accumulates and adds up to the fact that they actually have lower life expectancies um, than their peers from other groups. In terms of the social outcomes when compared to other racial and ethnic groups, they have the highest rates of incarceration, particularly for young black men and boys. Um, they have lower rates of high school graduation and much higher rates of poverty. When we look at Latino health outcomes, when compared to other um, racial and ethnic groups, we see that they actually have the highest teen birth rates, which makes sense with what I knew growing up. Um, and as with rural youth, we know that um, although overall in the United States we're making headway on teen births, we're really not making much headway when it comes to um, the rates of teen births in Latino populations. They are twice as likely as their peers to be uninsured and they have the highest rates of obesity. And that's likely linked to a couple of things that we know for sure from our studies. We know that they are much more likely to be spending a large amount of their day watching television, and they are the least likely of any racial ethnic group to participate in sports. In terms of mental health outcomes, when compared to other ethnic groups, they have the highest rates of depression and of suicidality, and they're most likely to have tried tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs. And the last group that we're gonna talk about this evening is undocumented youth. So when I say undocumented youth, what I mean is young, young immigrants who have come to the United States but don't have legal paperwork to be here. So these youth experience discrimination based on their ethnicity but also based on their documentation status itself. And while adolescence often has some periods of conflict in it as young people sort of what we say in medicine is individuate as they create their own personal identities and figure out who they are and how that's separate from their families. Um, this is particularly challenging for um, immigrant youth and undocumented youth because their experiences as youth might be incredibly different from the experiences that their parents had, causing an even greater amount of conflict at home. They also live with a continuous fear of deportation of themselves and of, them, of their loved ones. Um, and they report limitation of normal developmental milestones. We, we talk a lot in pediatrics about developmental milestones for little kids, but they actually happen in adolescence too. Um, and some of the social developmental milestones that we're used to seeing in the United States are people being able to get their driver's license, being able to vote, being able to go to college as young adults, being able to legally consume alcohol. These are many of the sort of milestones that my patients are very excited about. Um, and many of those are not attainable for undocumented youth. You cannot get a driver's license if you don't have paperwork work. You can't vote and you certainly can't apply for federal financial aid for college, which makes higher education very difficult for this population. In terms of physical health outcomes, um, we know that about 69% of undocumented youth are uninsured um, and 58% use the internet as their primary source of care when we're talking about teens and young adults. So they, they do not go to the doctor, they look on, they look on Google and that's where they're getting their health information. Um, and we also know, importantly, that children who are born in the United States, so citizens, um, who are born to undocumented parents are less likely to have insurance. Um, and this really has to do with sort of the complexity of the system itself, of parents' fears about interacting with the healthcare system. So even um, young children who are eligible for Medi-Cal, we know they are much less likely to be enrolled in Medi-Cal if they're coming from a family where there's mixed documentation status, where some people have papers and some people don't. Um, we also know that, you know, as I was saying, this is really related to this pervasive fear of interacting with the medical system and of governmental systems um, in order to access services. In terms of mental health outcomes, 
um, there are incredibly high rates of childhood trauma in these groups. Um, some of it is sort of what you might imagine, the direct trauma related to immigration, um, whether it's crossing the border or sort of being sent off with a stranger that they didn't know and having several days separated from sort of comforting adults. Um, and then there's also just the separation of, from families. Um, even intact families in the United States, if um, a parent is deported, that's incredibly traumatic for a child. Related to this trauma, they have quite high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and high rates of depression and suicidal ideation, so thoughts about killing themselves, um, and rates of anxiety. And then for many, um, sort of in an effort to cope with this massive burden of really inadequately um, treated mental health issues, um, we do know that there are some subset of this population that really engages in substance use as a coping mechanism for, all of, for this burden of mental health illness. So I've given you a lot of kind of depressing information about the about these populations. And I'd like to think together as a group a little bit about what causes the healthcare disparities that we're talking about. If we go back and we think about this, you know, the dynamic process that is adolescence, and we think about um, you know, these individual children from these high risk groups that should be going through all of these normal developmental phases, but for some reason, they are at more risk for, um, you know, destructive health behaviors. When we think about this group, what we really have to think about in order to problem solve is what's causing this? And the question that I'm gonna bring to you guys this evening is, why should we treat people without changing what makes them sick? So this is a question that's posed by the World Health Organization to really make us think about what, where these disparities in health are coming from. So I'm gonna start with you guys um, and ask you guys what you think. What do you think underlies the health disparities that we're talking about? Can you brainstorm with me some? Especially when you're talking about rural youth? Yeah, so access to care, particularly for rural populations. What else? Sure, so environmental, um, environmental health, in particular things like um, the effects of um, air and water pollution. And I think we could even perhaps extend that more and think about the environment. What else do you guys think? Mm -hmm. Access to healthy food. Mm -hmm. Access to healthy food, so that's a great way to extend the idea of environment. There's been a lot of work done around the idea of what's called a food desert in urban settings. So areas where there's such great poverty that the community can't support a robust grocery store. And then how on earth are sp people supposed to get? healthy food. What other things do you think underlie these health disparities? Uh, socioeconomic status. What does that mean, socioeconomic status? It's kind of a big word. So it's potential. Yeah. So I think that you captured that nicely, and I'm going to try and summarize some of what you said. So socioeconomic status is a big term, um, and it encompasses something about economics. It, it encompasses something about sort of where you fit on a social hierarchy um, and how things like your race and your income impact things like where you can live and how you um, interact with other members of society. So it's, a, it's another great example. Other ideas? Uh-huh. Great, so knowledge, health knowledge, um, might impact something like um, high teen birth rates. Other ideas? Okay, I think you guys have really generated a lot of great ideas. Um, and many of the things that you've talked about fall under what I will call the social determinants of health. So the World Health Organization defines the social determinants of health as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, and local, at global national, and local levels. Um, so I think that that actually really catches almost all of what you guys were identifying. And I'm going to share with you how I think about these things as a researcher who's interested in impacting um, the health of these marginalized communities. So this is something called the socioecologic framework. And it's basically a model that I use to organize all of the ideas that you guys were brainstorming, right? We can see how we really hit ideas at many of these levels. At the individual level, we talked about knowledge, about how knowledge uh, related to reproductive health might impact pregnancy outcomes. Um, I was telling you about um, interpersonal things in families and how family dynamics might impact health outcomes. We could think at the organizational level. When I think at the organizational level, I might think about a school. Um, you know, what are the uh, things 
that are available in a school health center, for example, that might impact outcomes. When we think about communities, we can think about cultural values and norms, things like um, are there religious beliefs that impact how someone might choose to use contraception? Are there religious beliefs that might impact how a family reacts to a youth that comes out as, um, as gay? Um, and then we can think about things at the policy level. And this is really where I try and drive all of my work back up to, is at the policy level. What could we do to impact care? And so then we're thinking about things like these undocumented patients of mine. They can't get care because they can't get Medi-Cal or they can't get insurance. And so what could we do at the public policy level to change outcomes for these people? So the other idea that I want to bring back to you guys is we threw out a lot of ideas in terms of um, what might impact health. But the important thing to remember is that everyone experiences um, factors that impact their health on all of these different levels that we've talked about. Okay, So the cumulative burden of problems or barriers at each of those levels really leads um, to poor health outcomes and an inability to access health care. And the sort of researchy term for this is a, is a term called um, allostatic load, which just again says it's just this cumulative burden of challenges. I'd like to tell you guys briefly about one of the studies that I've done recently that illustrates this really well. So I did a study last year where I went around California and did focus groups with youth who are eligible for um, something called DACA, or the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. And what that program is, is it's a program that gives temporary legal status to young people who immigrated when they were children um, and have otherwise been living here lawfully. And um, what we heard from our participants is that they're really it, there are issues at every single level of this model that really cause them problems with accessing health care. So at the individual level, what we heard is they said, I don't even know how to get a doctor. I've never had a doctor. How am I supposed to do that? I don't know. Um, on the family level, they told us, well, I don't know how to get a doctor because my mom's never been able to go to the doctor. And so she couldn't teach me anything about going to the doctor. Where am I supposed to learn that? And on the community level, they said, Everyone I know is kind of scared of going to the doctor. And they're kind of scared of signing up, trying to sign up for Medi-Cal. Because what if, what if the doctor reports them? And what if they get deported, right? Um, and so you can work your way out through all of these rungs and see how clearly, obviously, they could not access health care. Um, and how it's not surprising that they have poor health outcomes. But the thing that's really challenging about this is that you have to understand that even if we fix problems at one level, we won't necessarily be able to change the system that they're living in. So as an example, one participant told us, I've been working so hard, and I um, have saved up the money, and I'm going to UC Berkeley now. And I was so excited when I started at Berkeley because I had health insurance for the first time in my life. And I made a doctor's appointment like the first day on campus, and I went to Tang. And then I went in to see the doctor, and they asked me all these questions. They were asking me about who I had sex with. And they were asking me if I'd ever had vaccines. And it was weird, and it was embarrassing, and I didn't know the answer. I don't know if I've ever had any vaccines. And so I'm just never going back. Bummer, right? Fail, uh, you know, healthcare system failure. And so we really have to think for these groups that are falling through the cracks, what's happening and how can we change those outcomes at all of these different levels so we can help them be successful in, in caring for their health. So this brings me to my research. And I want to really start with this framework and the idea that addressing health disparities requires community and provider collaboration in order to actually make a difference in what's happening. It can't happen in the clinic. This is not something I can do one on one with a patient in an exam room. It's too big. It has to be done with the cooperation and um, input and buy-in of the communities that we're trying to impact. And our goal needs to be to make sustainable changes for these communities. So what strategies can researchers use to understand and influence the social determinants of health that we've been talking about? I'm going to pitch my favorite to you guys today. Um, and that is something called community-based participatory research. This is a term that's thrown around a lot, and so I want to get a little bit specific about what it means to me as a researcher. 
So community-based participatory research is a collaborative process that equitably involves all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each group brings. Um, I'm going to abbreviate community-based participatory research and call it CBPR. It's a little more concise for the rest of my talk. Um, but I want you to sort of hear with me at the beginning of this that CBPR is really an ideal tool for impacting the health of marginalized and hard to reach communities. And that's because we have a lot of wonderful public health programming in the United States. In many ways, we have really great um, outcomes in, um, in many ways in terms of our health. But for some reason, in these communities that we're talking about today, those big public health outreach projects are not impacting adequately. They're just not getting through. And so we're going to use our partnership with these communities to think about how we can build programming that will actually help them. It's important also to think about what CBPR is not. CBPR is not taking an intervention that worked in a different community and plopping it down in, in the community that is uh, continuing to have poor health outcomes. Right? That is not being sensitive to what that community needs. It's not asking yourself, why hasn't this worked here yet? So I'm going to run through briefly um, some of the major principles of community-based participatory research. CBPR, really, the foundation of it is that it recognizes the community as a unit of identity um, and that it builds on the strengths and resources within the community. CBPR is collaborative, and it's an equitable partnership through all phases of the research. So what I mean is the community members and their opinions matter just as much as the researchers and their ideas, OK? Um, everyone is equal in this process. And that power sharing is one of the things that begins to really address the social inequality that's created the health outcomes that we're seeing. CBPR fosters learning from both sides and capacity building on both sides. So what I mean by that is researchers kind of have this bad rap. We go into communities and we study them, um, and then we, we walk away without giving anything. And what we really need to come to the table with as researchers who do community-based participatory research is we need to understand that we are coming in with expertise in things like how to measure things and how to investigate and how to find stuff out. But the community is an expert in what's happening there. They know what is causing these poor health outcomes. And unless we partner together with both of our expertises, we're not going to make a difference. So CBPR is about a balance between knowledge generation and intervention. And it has to help both the researcher and the um, community, most importantly. CBPR focuses on the local relevance of public health problems. Again, we're not trying to fix the world with community-based participatory research. The whole point is we're really focusing on the needs of one particular group. And we're thinking about how the determinants of health can really be impactful at many different levels. And we're trying to investigate all those different levels when we're thinking about a community-based approach. These approaches have to be cyclical. So we talk to some community members, um, we come up with a plan, and then we try it. And we have to keep talking to the community members and ask how it's working, and ask more community members, and ask different ones, and think about different stakeholders who can teach us. Um, and it's that cycl cyclical and iterative process that's actually successful in creating sustainable changes. It's important as part of CBPR to really share the results with all of the partners. So one thing that needs to happen you know, in CBPR is that it's not just going to turn into an academic publication um, to be found on PubMed 10 years later. right? It needs to be disseminated to every community-based organization in the community so that they can try and use it to improve health outcomes. Um, it should be reviewed and validated by community members as it's written up. Researchers need to come back and say, we think this is what we found. Are we getting it right? Is this what you guys are telling us? What can we do to improve this to make sure it's really saying what you're, what you're experiencing? And the goal of CBPR is that it's a long-term process with sustainable work. And so communities change over time. And a really high-quality CBPR study is a longitudinal study where it's responsive to those changes. For example, um, some work that I've done in New York City, one of the changes that we saw over the course of our study is that our um, Latino patient base shifted over time in the neighborhood we were looking at. And so at the beginning, we were 
dealing with a lot of Puerto Rican families. And over the course of our study, we were seeing more and more Dominican families, right? And that's a shift that's going to change the needs of the community. It's going to change the health outcomes that you're targeting. So you have to, again, have that iterative process where you're thinking about making a sustainable change that's going to be responsive to the community as it grows and develops. As part of CBPR, you really need to come in with this idea of cultural humility. You cannot assume that you know anything about a, about a group, right? As I was saying, we had Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Their needs were incredibly different. And just because I'm a researcher who has a lot of experience working with Latino populations doesn't mean a thing, right? You have to come in. Rural Latino populations might have very different needs from urban populations. Again, it's targeted at each community's needs. So what does this actually look like when we take it out on the ground? I'm going to show you one study that I did. Um, so this case example is a study that I did in my home state in New Mexico. Um, I went back thinking about our, my very high rates of teen pregnancy at home, and I wanted to study the factors that influenced young women's utilization of reproductive health care. Um, and so I went into New Mexico into a rural border community. New Mexico is um, a very large state geographically, and so the population is very spread out. It's actually the fifth largest state in the United States in terms of land mass, um, but there are only two million people in all of New Mexico, so that's like less than the number of people who are in Manhattan on any given day, right? Um, it's also an interesting state because it's a minority majority state like California, so there are more Latinos in the state than any other group of people. Um, and the county that I was going into was Doñana County, which is in southern New Mexico, right on the Mexico border. It has a population of about 200,000 people, and they're really spread out. It's a large county, and they're very spread out. It's quite rural. Um, and 14% um, report being directly from Mexico in this county. Doña Ana County is also very impoverished. 31% um, of people live below the federal poverty line. And just to kind of give some perspective, in California, when we talk about poor populations, we're often talking about populations who are at 150% or even up to 400% of the federal poverty line, and we consider them impoverished. These are truly people who live below the federal poverty line. They are very, very poor. 18% um, of residents are foreign born, and half of households speak primarily Spanish. Um, the vast majority of the immigrants in this area are from Mexico. About 90% are from Mexico. In terms of reproductive health, as I've told you guys, New Mexico has the highest rates of teen pregnancy, and still does, unfortunately, to this day, with a rate of about 93 per thousand in all teen girls. And for reference, um, California has a rate of about 75 per thousand. Um, and it has even higher rates in Latina teens, 127 per thousand among Latinas. Interestingly, it has fairly low abortion rates, um, and we can think some together about that. It's a very complex question as to exactly why. So going into this study, I was interested in understanding the barriers to utilizing reproductive health care in this community. And I really wanted to try and do some sort of capacity building to think about how we can inform the development of a clinic in this community. And um, so I partnered with Planned Parenthood New Mexico. So Planned Parenthood New Mexico was founded in the 60s. There are three offices across the entire state. Um, and it provides services um, to about uh, 25,000-ish patients each year. Um, and Planned Parenthood had previously tried to open a clinic in southern New Mexico. And they had bought real estate. They had opened the clinic. They had employed um, physicians and nurse practitioners. And then the clinic failed for financial reasons. No one came. And this didn't make sense, right? Because we know that we're in the state with the highest rates of teen pregnancy and the counties with the highest rate of teen pregnancy. So what went wrong? I was interested in finding that out. And to do that, I really wanted to go directly to the community itself and ask. So this is Bianca Zamora, who is a research assistant from Planned Parenthood who worked with me. Um, and we went in and did focus groups in the community. So for um, those of you who haven't done them or seen them, focus groups are basically a group interview. Um, the person who's leading it has a general list of questions, but you're also just interested in using those questions as kind of a prompt to see what ideas come up. And um, the thought behind focus groups is that you may not even know the right questions to ask, right? You could send out a survey, but if you don't even have the right questions on the survey, then you're never going to capture what's causing the health outcomes that you're interested in. So the conversation and the sort of spontaneity of focus groups is really key. 
Um, the subjects that we recruited were young women in Doña Ana County. And we did four focus groups with 32 participants. And we targeted our um, sort of recruitment to the average age that Planned Parenthood treated um, in the state of New Mexico at the time of the study. Um, so the median age for our um, group was 23 years old. About two thirds of them were Latina. Um, a third reported being uninsured and about a third were on Medicaid. Um, in terms of religious breakdown, it, it was very similar to New Mexican demographics on the whole, with about 40% Catholic, another third or so Christian, um, and then the remainder sort of a mixture or not identifying with a particular religion. In terms of the results that we found, so the participants really spent a lot of time reflecting on their own experiences as adolescents and talked about barriers to reproductive health that included both access issues and sort of more social and cultural issues. Um, so in terms of the access issues, we heard loud and clear that just actually accessing physician care was a huge barrier um, to getting reproductive health care. One participant told us, I think it's just really hard to find like a doctor, period. I haven't gone to a pap smear for like years, only because it just frustrates me so much that I don't even want to think about it. I know it's bad, and maybe I should, I know, and my family has that history of uterine cancer. We heard about access to health knowledge, as someone was saying earlier. Um, one, one participant told us, I remember being like a scared 15-year-old, like, oh my god, who do I talk to? They don't talk about it in school. My mom never talks to me about it. I'm like in a really scary situation. I could be pregnant, I could have STDs, I'm gonna die, you know? I don't know what's going on with my body. And so when I wanted information, I didn't know where to go. I had no idea where to go. And there wasn't a Planned Parenthood. I knew about Planned Parenthood, but I also knew it was really far away. And so it just didn't exist. And the whole conversation never happened. And so feeling comfortable with myself didn't really exist. Our participants told us that they also thought that there were issues in terms of youth accessing social programming. One participant explained, I think it's really just too small. Like, if you ask anybody, the only thing to do around here is drink. That's it. You drink, you hook up, you sleep with somebody. In terms of the social and cultural issues our participants identified, um, they were particularly eloquent about um, the lack of providers that they could connect well with. One participant explained, they need to understand their population. They need to understand that there's older, traditional Hispanic women in this community, younger, not traditional Hispanic women. There's Indians, Native Americans, all kinds of populations. And you can't necessarily have one tailored message to everybody. Religion played a huge role in how women chose to access uh, reproductive health care in this community. And particularly, the Catholic Church's influence was really noticeable in all of our focus groups. One participant said, for any young girl who might need to get an abortion, there's going to be that Catholic guilt. Because we have the Virgin Mary, who's constantly in our face, you know. And there's this image of like, this is what a woman is supposed to be. And so a lot of young girls who have had that experience or have had to have an abortion are like guilted so terribly. And you just have to be really conscious of this and be really careful with it. Finally, they also told us about what I've come to call a politically divided community. Um, and this was not just about sort of politics in terms of, of conservative and liberal, but there was also really a sort of a generational divide in how different people saw reproductive health and reproductive health care. Um, one participant explained, my best friend got pregnant when she was 16. And the reason she wasn't on birth control because her it was because her dad didn't approve of it. And so she just led, like ignored it and didn't do anything. I've known other girls like that, too. It's just like, if their parents don't approve, they don't know where to go. So they just pretend the problem doesn't exist. So kind of synthesizing all of these different ideas that our participants shared with us, we learned several things. We learned that there are both barriers um, in terms of health systems and sociocultural barriers that really impact access to reproductive health care for young women and teens in Doniana County. And we learned that women in this region want more reproductive health services, and they want education about reproductive health so that they can take care of their bodies. And we also learned that 
um, public health measures to improve access and to improve health education really are going to need to anticipate and respect the region's political and social environment. So it's not going to be helpful to go into this community and ignore the effects of the Catholic Church, for example, or ignore these intergenerational divides. They really have to be addressed head on with partnerships um, if we're going to make any headway in, that, in what's happening in this community. So why did it matter that we used community-based participatory research in this case? Um, this is a community of teens with persistently poor health outcomes, and prior interventions have failed, as we were saying. We know that both rural youth and Latino youth are these populations where, although teen pregnancy rates are falling across the United States, these kids are immune to that for some reason. They're not improving. And so it's really critical to go in and ask hard questions and try and figure out what's different, what's unique that's happening here. And in this particular case, we used a pairing of qualitative methods where we could have those conversations directly with community members and community-based participatory research to allow us to acknowledge the community as experts in these challenges that they're facing. So I want to kind of close this part of my talk with uh, one last quote from my focus groups that I find the most resonating for me. This participant said, I think the community itself plays a small role, especially with the teen pregnancies and stuff like that. Because every time there's an article or something like that in the paper or something on the news about teen pregnancy in Las Cruces, everybody gets really fired up. These girls need to close their legs, you know? What kind of parents do they have? And it's like, you know, maybe if we just gave them the knowledge they needed. Like everyone wants to know why this girl doesn't have any sense, but it's like, because you never gave it to her. You never gave her the knowledge to protect herself from this. And so we do. We have a community that wants to get all fired up about ending teen pregnancies, but it doesn't want to get fired up about sex ed. It doesn't want to get fired up about giving teens condoms or helping their daughters and sons plan out birth control for their relationships. No one wants to do that work. There was a pause in the focus group room while well, kind of everyone let that thought settle in. And then one participant said simply, I think it's worth the fight. So we'll go back to our question from the beginning of our talk and ask, why treat people without changing what makes them sick? And I really want you guys to take away from this talk the idea that we can go to communities, that they are experts in their health, and they can teach us how to improve their health outcomes. And I'd like to sort of close this part of our talk um, by thanking the people who've helped me do this work, particularly the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine, Charles Irwin, who's the head of that division and one of my mentors, and Carolyn Jasek, who's in the audience today and helped me prepare this presentation. And our funding for um, our work there comes from a grant, an educational grant from the Maternal Child Health Bureau. And then also the Institute of Health Policy Studies and Claire Brindis, my mentor there, who's done amazing, has had a, an amazing career of work um, addressing community concerns. And I'd like to open up for discussion and kind of hear you guys and what you think about some of the ideas that we've thrown out today. Yeah, so I think that there's a few ways. I didn't present to you guys sort of the other topic that we talked about in, that, in those focus groups was really getting to the nitty gritty details of so how could we actually build a clinic, like physically, how could we do it that you would come? And we really heard a lot of things that were new and novel to us and challenging. So as some examples, unsurprisingly, um, people told us privacy is premium. We live in these small communities. As soon as you like, you know, park your car outside of one of these clinics, everybody knows and someone's telling your mom. And so they literally told us things like, you need to have parking that's like behind a wall or behind bushes. And they told us where in town would be the best places to locate clinics so that teens could get to them on a bus route, for example, um, if we were doing it in the sort of largest community in town. They also um, told us things like, you know, particular churches that we might begin partnering with to create inroads um, into the community, um, you know, that, that would be most receptive to ideas around improving teen pregnancy and health outcomes for Latinos. Um, and so I think it's, there were sort of two ways in which we were trying to use that information. One of them was that Planned Parenthood took the data and started applying for grants using it 
um, to make a case for how they could build a clinic and do a better job this time and better address the health outcomes for these, pa these patients. But then also taking that data and really actually using it in a very fundamental way to drive how that clinic is built and working. And if you really want to do the best job that you can, you need to continuously involve the community in that planning process. Right, so you take what they've told us now, you pick a site, you drop a plan, but then you go back to the community before you invest all that money in building and ask them, like, would this work? Is this what you mean? Or are we understanding you correctly? And that's the iterative process that we were talking about before, where you're really going back and asking the community for their expertise and what could make you successful. Ah. It's like being a kid in a candy store, Dr. Jessic. That's hard to pick. So the question was, what are the, um, what are some of the federal or state policies that I would like to see change so that we can begin to address some of these issues? Um, I think that, um, I think that first I will step back and put on my cultural humility cap and say that I haven't done this work in all of these communities. And so I don't know the answer um, in terms of what will really penetrate. But the communities that I know the most are, um, the Latino communities in California, and particularly the undocumented communities in California. And so I think um, if I start to hypothesize in those groups, um, what I've heard from my research participants is that um, particularly making very public things like um, what what uh, patients can and cannot be deported for. So for example, there's a very common misunderstanding that physicians will report a patient for their documentation status. And in fact, we're not reporters um, in terms of um, immigration issues. And so I don't think there's a physician out there that would report a patient in terms of documentation status, but it's a very common misconception. Um, I think in part because we're mandatory reporters for other things like child abuse. Um, so I think um, creating um, public health campaigns or messaging that really gets out, out those ideas so that people have accurate health uh, information about accessing health care. Um, and then also, one thing that I'm very interested right now in is looking at how, on a systems level, the system is responsive to change. Um, so as an example, during the course of my study with undocumented youth, California actually changed its policy. And it decided that if you had this temporary legal status, that you should be eligible for Medi-Cal. Um, and some of the youth in my study went into Medi-Cal offices and said, we heard on the news that we can get Medi-Cal now. We'd like to sign up. And the Medi-Cal worker said, I don't know. I've never seen that. I don't think you're eligible. I'm going to try and put it in my computer. Nope. It says no. And the youth who had really like gathered all of their courage to walk into this office were like, oh, well, I guess I was wrong. And they went home. And they told all of their friends, it's not true. We're not eligible. Um, and so thinking about on a systems level how we're responsive to these changes, because we are seeing all of these huge policy changes in terms of opening up access to health care through the Affordable Care Act, and we're seeing slow progress towards um, progressive immigration reform, but it only matters if it can actually be implemented on the systems level and for the individual patients who need it. So the study that I'm doing right now is looking at how Medi-Cal um, response to these changes and how they really get the word out to their employees and how they change their systems um, and looking at how we can do that as quickly and um, flexibly as possible. Church is Catholic? Yep, absolutely. And so I think, again, the takeaway is that um, our participants were very clear um, that that the church is not a monolithic institution. It is an institution full of individuals, and each individual has its own life experiences and different ideas. Um, and so it is true that, you know, that there are sort of church policies on the whole, but how each individual church and each individual church member chooses to interpret those um, and live them in their day-to-day -day life varies a great deal. And so there was actually a lot of room for um, partnership with Catholic churches in the community. I think that the other thing that we heard that was very challenging for Planned Parenthood to take in when I brought them the results back was the idea that the community said, oh gosh, we desperately need your services. I mean, clearly we need your services. Um, but you just can't, you can't provide abortions here. No one's going to walk in the door if you provide abortions. Um, and that was something that was, that was there was a tension when I took that back to Planned Parenthood because they said, you know, we provide comprehensive reproductive health services, including abortions. And I said, not in this community if you want to be able to provide contraception, right? If you go in and you provide contraception, you can decrease teen pregnancy rates to begin with. Um, and so 
really thinking about, again, the community is an expert in what's happening there. And they are telling us what they need from us in order to be able to receive the contraception that we're trying to provide them and that they, they want and need. And if we don't hear that and we're not responsive to it, then we won't be able to help them. But it requires us as researchers and as healthcare providers being flexible to meet those needs. Um, I think I think so. I mean, like by the by the time that my discussions with them ended, that's where we clearly were. But it was definitely sort of the the initial reaction was like, oh, that wasn't what we had in mind. Um, but I think that you know they don't provide those services at every location to begin with. Even in, you know in New Mexico, they don't, um, and it's not. Um, the most fundamental thing that they provide. They want to be able to give people safe abortions, I think. But, um, you know, I, I think that they were, they were very open to what the community was saying. It just wasn't what they were quite expecting to hear. Think about. Yeah, I think there is a tension between kind of, um, between this idea of us, us as physicians, as healthcare providers, as researchers, knowing what a community needs. Because on some level, even I hear that, and I think to myself, well, of course I know what they need. They need birth control, right? Um, but you also have to remember that a community might be in crisis in a way that you never anticipated. So for example, if a community doesn't have a safe place, safe places to live, if they don't have food, right, if they don't have shelter, if they don't have access to basic education, of course they can't, can't deal with these sort of other secondary um, things that are not life-sustaining, right? Um, and so I think that is why it's so important to, to go in, to not make any assumptions about how to fix one individual problem without seeing that whole system and in interacting and thinking about how it's functioning and what they might need. Yeah, I think, I think I was also very impressed that Planned Parenthood was interested in going back into that community. And in particular, um, for them, we talked on a sort of systems level about how it was a little bit of a risk. Um, so Planned Parenthood in New Mexico at the time was not taking federal funding um, for their clinics. And that's why it mattered so much if people showed up, <laughs> because they were actually payer driven. Um, and the reason that they did that is that they had found in the political environment at the time that things were just too volatile, that they couldn't stay stably funded if they were relying heavily on federal funds. And so they'd made that decision um, for their own stability. But it meant that they really needed people in the door. Um, but they also were and clearly, when I was working with them, com you know, incredibly committed to g trying to ameliorate some of these health disparities that they saw. And you know, again, highest teen pregnancy rates in the country for the state, and highest teen pregnancy rates in the state for the county. So this is a really high risk population that they were very committed to trying to help. It was a pleasure to work with them. So I think that um, that this approach is really built for. Um, what I kind of think of as these, these gap communities, these communities that are sort of falling through the cracks with our other major health programming. Um, and I think that as a whole, as a country, um, the communities that are those marginalized communities that are sort of falling through the cracks will change over time. Um, for example, sort of on a, if we step back on a very big picture scale, we know that um, the Latino population is growing rapidly in the United States. And so um, as that happens, it's likely that kind of on a population level, we might be able to create interventions that are more and more responsive to that community. Um, but that there will still be communities like, say, rural Latinos who are falling through the cracks. Um, and I think that this is a great strategy for really trying to target um, whichever groups it is at any given time um, that we aren't able to target in other ways. Um, I think that there will always be particular communities or particular groups of people that are going to need the support in some new and different way, especially just because things change over time, right? Sometimes it might be refugees that are coming in that we don't anticipate. Um, sometimes it might be sort of, you know, groups that are marginalized for changing political reasons, things like that. Yeah, so I think that this is likely to be, uh, this was likely to continue to be a robust strategy for um, addressing the, the, the health disparities that exist for any sort of gap communities. I think it's one of the wonderful things about it is that it's so incredibly adaptable. Um, and it's not that you don't, it's not that you leave all of your other research knowledge out the door, it's that you come in with all that research knowledge and say, I have research knowledge and you have community knowledge, and how do we put those two things together to be able to change health outcomes in your community? You don't reinvent the wheel every time. Yeah, so the question is, what are some of the barriers to implementing a community-based participatory research approach? Um, certainly it's, um, 
it is resource intensive in terms of like having um, researchers who are able to do it, who are willing to go and engage with communities. Um, the other reality is that for some of these marginalized communities, there have been really um, egregious historical interactions with, with the research base um, that have made it really challenging for them to interact with researchers. Um, you know, the sort of the big classic example, of course, is Tuskegee. Um, but when, so when we're going into these marginalized populations, it's really important to really spend some time getting to know the stakeholders in the community, figuring out who are the community members that you can partner with and building trust with those organizations. So for example, when I was doing my research in undocumented youth, um, it's, it's hard to recruit for those studies, right? You don't really sit around in the mission and kind of ask everybody, do you have papers? Do you have papers? It doesn't fly. Um, and so what we had to do is spend a lot of time partnering with the community-based organizations, um, working with um, the different political advocacy groups, working with um, advocacy groups that focused on Latino and immigrant health, um, and slowly sort of building partnerships so that we could disseminate um, information about our work, both recruitment and then results, um, through trusted channels. And um, I think part of successful CBPR is really anticipating that long timeline and giving yourself the time that you need to build those partnerships. Um, thank you so much for coming, in spite of the Giants game. <laughs>